The reality is most makers I know are severely underpaid when they could be making a ton more. Most people think in order to get there, they need more certificates, they need more courses, they need more tutorials. What's the one biggest problem that solution architects are making on a regular basis? That is Django, Python, PHP, Laravel. What is the core problems all these other tools solve? And then which are the limitations of every single one of these tools. You're passionate about designing and delivering solutions that bring measurable value. What does this mean to you? I think the fundamental issue that I see the most often is that Hey, welcome to this week's episode of Power Talks. My name is Griffin Lickfeld, the host of the Citizen Developer Channel, and today I am joined by a special guest, Sean Astrahan. And Sean contract wow. Sean contracts for Microsoft as a solutions architect and team lead. He also runs the Architects Accelerator, which is a radical training program that takes new and experienced power platform makers and consultants and turns them into solution architects. As a previous pro code developer that has worked on almost every stack, he is able to apply those skills to finding low code solutions for enterprise systems that has with as little effort as possible. Sean, welcome to the show. Thank you, Griffin. Man, please speak at my, uh, please make my obituary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I will say with confidence, um, Copilot and ChatGPT did not write the intro. So, you know, I like to put a little personal touch oh, on there, it. but. Uh, you know, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Sean, I would love to, we'll definitely get to what this Architects Accelerator is, but you know, my first question for you really is, what has your consulting career kind of looked like? Because in getting to know you, it sounds very different from like mine or other guests I've had on this show. So I would love to just give you the floor and you know, on what your your career looks like. Yeah, so like most consultants and typical Power Apps makers, I started out as a middle school Spanish teacher, and before that I worked at a Mexican restaurant. So eventually I realized I wanted a career in tech, I wanted the opportunities, the money, and I wanted the problem solving. So then I got into .NET over 10 years ago using Dynamics 365. I transitioned to all these other tech frameworks. I did Django, Python, PHP, Laravel. View. I, like, I can keep naming them, but it's not interesting. I got back into Power <laughs> Platform and kind of having been around the block, so to speak, in tech, it's given me a kind of a unique vantage point to these technologies. So that's me in a nutshell, tech-wise. Yeah. What does it, ex explain what it means to, you know, work on a contract basis for Microsoft. Like, oh. What, what yeah, does yeah. That so of? plenty of people contract for Microsoft and we are, it feels a lot like we're employees. Some people I'm sure maybe only do a few hours a week, but I'm full time. Like a few other contractors, they keep us on. We really feel like part of the team. Uh, in my case, I lead a team. I have other developers. I have to review their work, give work, uh, overview, take a look at the architecture and then it is, but we go through a different company and that other company uh, manages the relationship and I'm minimally with them and all my interactions are with Microsoft. Yeah, and this is a little bit of a tangent, but like, why do you enjoy this? Why do you find working this way with Microsoft is maybe beneficial for you or maybe the benefits that you find working in this manner that you like? Yeah, so what I do like about it is when you're inside of Microsoft and you're a full-time employee, it's amazing. You get all kinds of benefits. They treat you really well. Uh, my friends who are FTEs, full-time employees, uh, really enjoy it. The only downside is you can't be an MVP. You lose all your badges, and you pretty much, like, now that you're in, you miss out on all that stuff. And I do enjoy it. I do enjoy being a community member in that regard. Yeah. Absolutely, and I'm sure we will we will end up end up talking about that. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, I want to again kind of give you the floor here and just explain, and what, I want to talk about this in much more detail, like what the Architect Accelerator is at a at a high level, and, and take as much time as you need here. You know, the 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 full blown business pitch here. You know, oh, you want the business pitch? All right. <laughs> Uh, am I talking to you, Griffin, a uh, aspiring architect, or am I talking to a company who's trying to um, hire, who's trying to train up their staff? 
You could do a, an aspiring architect. Yeah. An aspiring architect. All right. The reality is most makers I know are severely underpaid. They make probably around like 100K and they stick around that area. That's 100K USA. You can apply that average salary to other countries when they could be making a ton more around the area that I've seen of the most successful around 200K. Now, the downside I see of that is most people think in order to get there, they need more certificates, they need more courses, they need more tutorials. And that's terrific. That expands your technological abilities. However, the key things most architects I see that are missing is they don't have the business sense, they don't understand features versus outcomes, and they do not know how to build solutions that create tangible, measurable value for that business. A business does not want you to just blindly follow their directions. They want you to understand the big picture. They don't want you to give thoughtless estimates and be obsessed with the tech and miss out on what they need. So the Architects Accelerator, I'm pitching it as like, oh, I'm gonna help you make so much more money. It's not that. Although that is one of the big outcomes I want for everyone to make more money. The other things that come with it are confidence in meetings. You know technologically what all the tools do and how they all integrate and how that will actually drive that measurable, tangible outcomes for that business. And then the last piece of it is they have the confidence that they are the expert. They don't have to question it. They don't have to worry about it. And then the ultimate goal is, this is ideal architecture for me, they build flexible solutions with minimal effort. Flexible solutions, minimal effort, higher pay, comfortable in meetings. That is my dream for every single person who comes through it. Speaking to you, Griffin, if I'm speaking <laughs> to a company who's trying to staff their people, I come up to them and say, you're probably disappointed in some ways with the people that you've hired. Maybe not this current team. This current team's amazing and hungry and wants to do well, but do they understand big picture? Do they understand licensing? Do they understand how to build systems that work for you now, but also scale in the future? And the most important thing, do they tell you when you're going into the wrong direction? Do they tell you when there's a different tool that could solve the same thing and more and get that all done faster? How was that pitch? Yeah, I feel like, uh, was that your first time ever doing that? You know, I feel like you, uh, you know, I'm just kidding. You got that well rehearsed and, uh, and, and uh, locked down there. I, uh, I think that pitch is phenomenal. One question that spurs though. So is this Architect Accelerator program, um, I was under the impression in learning about it, it was, you know, a, I don't want to just bring it down to the level of a course. It's much more than that. But it, for the sake of describing it in one word, I was under the impression it was a course, but it almost sounds like it's more of a, an education system, but also helps in like the actual placement of the people that go through it. Is that true? Um, like, you're, are you talking to businesses and are saying, "Hey, I have this person that went through this program"? Or is that what you're talking about when you're saying you're you're pitching to businesses as well? Or so when I say I'm like, pitching to businesses, it's a lot of businesses have been reaching out. Again, zero advertising on my end. It's pure word of mouth are like, I took this, this is amazing, I want other team members of mine to take it as well. I and see. then that's who I'm talking about. In terms of placement, I'm surprisingly secretive. I have a lot of very talented people who've come through this program and I'm not giving them out to recruiters just yet. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, cool, cool. And then um, I, I guess I, I wanted to ask you, I think I'm understanding a little bit more about what this program is, um, but why? maybe a little bit more into your story, but why did you decide to make, go through all this effort and make this program and now manage this program? I mean, I know that's no easy feat, um, especially because it's not, it's not like it's pre-recorded lectures or different things. You know, it's you meeting with small groups of people um, and, and coaching them. Like, why did you decide to make the Architect Accelerator happen? Yeah, I can't not teach in the sense that it's not just because I probably have a huge ego and love the sound of my own voice like every content creator, except you, Griffin, you don't have that. Uh, <laughs> the reason I wanted to do it is I love technological problems. They're very enjoyable to solve. I love solving the gap between someone not knowing someone thing 
and then somebody knowing that same thing and making that leap in a 30 minute to one hour period or if I can do it in a six minute video and really understanding like why they're learning it, how are they learning it, and in the end, did they truly get it? And I, again, as I mentioned earlier, I've jumped through so many different technical stacks. So I've gone through so many tutorials, so many live trainings, and in the end, I found so few, if not zero, that can accurately measure, did I actually learn that? Did I master that? Mm. Which is the whole reason that so far, I haven't made this a self-paced course. Although there are elements that are very self-paced, you do it on your own time. But like to actually prove you've learned this stuff, you have to come to the live session. You have to demonstrate what you learned. We take it apart. We look at ways that you did it very well or look at ways that it could grow in a very comforting way where no one's like called out like you did this wrong. It's just we all come together and try to solve a problem and everyone tries to put, pitch in their own way. And that's where the true assessment comes in. Yeah. So you mentioned, you, you rattled them off too quickly for me to keep up, but you mentioned, you know, things like actual, you know, you, you talk about the power platform and the different components. You talk about licensing. What are some other, you know, I'm not telling you to give away your secret sauce here, but like what's, what's some other maybe the, you know, the titles of the lessons or something that, that's a part of this program? Oh, like secret! The, the I'll things, give you all the secret sauce, Griffin. The, thi <laughs> the things a part of the program that, like, if I was signing up, I would expect to learn. I guess. Okay, even if you weren't expecting to learn this, it's what you need to know as an architect. This isn't also, by the way, this curriculum was built obviously from my ten years of experience. But I've pulled in all kinds of architects who are very talented, who I've also recommended to be on your show, from Parvez to Franco, just to name a few. Neil Benson inspired me in a lot of ways. And like getting in these perspectives of like, here's what I want the architects on my team to know, or here's what they already know, which is what I love about them. So in this case, we're doing AI, of course, but we're not just blindly following Copilot Studio. Right away, we identify what it does, what it doesn't do, when do we need to get into Azure AI Studio, and why is that potentially much more cost effective. We get into data integrations, we get into API syncs, we get into deployments, we, now I'm reading it now, we get into security, it's all on the site, it's really the 10 fundamental concepts I see that every systems yeah. architect needs. And I think where it really goes above and beyond is you could take all these 10 concepts and go do them in Java and Salesforce if you want. They're platform agnostic. We obviously use Power Platform for all the examples and that's where, if that's your background, you're gonna get the most benefit out of it. But these are just software best practices. It has nothing to do with uh, memorizing the Power Platform feature by feature. Sure. So, okay. Question. I was, I, this is kind of, I think I'm sure everybody, at least at a high level understands what this is now, but I kind of wanted to take little, you know, pick your brain, take little nuggets of things that you might offer in this platform or in this, in this, uh, the program. I mean, this is, we could probably talk about this for 30 minutes, but like, what's the, what's the one biggest problem that you find that solution architects are making on a regular basis? They're not asking for enough in their salary reviews. Um, so that <laughs> is, that's not actually what I mean. I think the fundamental issue that I see the most often is that they use the technologies they know and they're biased by them. And they're very uncomfortable potentially recommending a solution which is in an area they don't know. Of course, they don't recommend it, because they don't know it, but they don't know a strategy to quickly learn the main uh, tiers of a solution or of a technology. Like, how do you know, how can you learn what Copilot Studio does and doesn't do in a short amount of time in a way that you can effectively consult a potential customer about that? So they're biased by their own solutions. They recommend like, um, like in your case, if you would be making the mistake of recommending Dynamics 365 sales in all circumstances when there could be something else. Of course, you don't do that because me and you are awesome. But like other people <laughs> can run into that issue. I will give a very tangible one for whoever's listening right now. Yeah. I was literally on a call with a senior solutions architect, higher title than I have, 
and he was trying to solve the problem of in Dataverse, he was trying to do this complex join from one table to another inside of the advanced find in ways that the UI doesn't support. And the customer really wanted it, but he couldn't do that. So his solution here was, oh, I see, I know what we can do. We can actually take the solution, that XML, we can modify the fetch XML inside of it to support this complex query we're trying to do, but, and that was his solution. And I just raised my hand and said, but if you do your own custom fetch XML, the customer will never be able to modify that as an end user. He's like, correct. I was like, okay. And then from then on, other developers are going to have to know that you just Frankenstein that XML solution, right? He's like, yes, correct. I was like, okay, okay. And then I, again, I asked none of this because I don't want to like sound um, annoying in meetings. I just sure. kind of like waited until the meeting was kind of coming to an end. And then I calmly asked like, how often do you need to like use these custom filters and get all of this? And then the customer said, oh, it's just only a couple times a year. I was like, oh, okay. You know, there's this other tool that can do all these relationships for you and it doesn't take as much work to create a UI for it that you control and it's called Power BI. And he's like, oh, we, wait, we could, we, we could do that? Yeah, that's much better. And then of course the other senior <laughs> I was like, you know what, I was gonna recommend that. I was like, I know you were. I was just, you know, te teeing you uh -huh. up for that. So that's just like a simple answer of like, am I a Power BI expert? No, you will learn that in the sessions. We go into Power BI, but I understand the like fundamental tiers as I was mentioning of that tool and like what to look out for and when it is the more appropriate solution here. So that's an example of someone being over biased by the tools of that they know. If you are thinking to yourself that you want to get into low code development or learn about the Power Platform, then I want to personally invite you to sign up for this completely free self-paced course that is gonna cover everything you need to know to begin low code development today. Not too long ago, I was a complete beginner and I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't even know what the Power Platform was. But in just two years, I have gone from being an associate to a senior level consultant and I can truly say that I love what I do. The content in this course is handpicked by me so you can understand the basics of the Power Platform and ultimately be prepared to take the PL900 certification if that's something you're interested in. If you are interested, be sure to follow the first link in the description down below and do not forget to use the promo code YouTube at checkout in order to get the course for completely free. This is going to give you immediate access to the entire course so that you can start to change your future today. Now, let's get back to the conversation. So say, well, we'll continue with this hypothetical. Let's say, I have a bias where I am only able to, you know, see through the lens of Microsoft dynamic sales um, and, you know, model driven apps and, you know, some basic power automates, you know, and that's, that's what I know. How do I, how do I break that bias? Like, how do I, obviously one being aware that I have that bias, but like what would be the, the first couple steps in improving in that area so that I can, you know, be a, a more well-rounded con senior consultant, architect, senior architect? Okay, uh, my first question would be, do you really want to? Because if you become, by going wide like this, by having these expertise in these other areas, you will become weaker in Dynamics 365 sales. You will inevitably, as a solutions architect, you go wide, you don't go deep, and you're not going to always be able to rattle off how a specific feature works. So are you okay with that? We'll continue with, with and say yes. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, how do you start? The best way to start is to be put in situations where that tool is not an option working with a customer who can't afford it. They can't afford Dynamics 365 for sales. They have too small of a team. They, and here is where, um, besides just kind of like licensing when that becomes a limitation, another one to watch out for is when you really feel like you're starting to hack it. When there isn't a bunch of out of the box solutions for what you're trying to do. Like for instance, if they want the ability to upload a lot of documents, very large documents, that go beyond that, um, like the file column in Dynamics, uh, once it goes beyond that Dataverse file size, if they wanna do that. And then they wanna tag those certain documents. Like, 
you can start to Frankenstein your way for dynamics to do that, but you're soon going to realize like, okay, this isn't it. There's, there's got to be something else. And of course, like SharePoint's going to come to your mind for whoever's listening and knows that that's the most appropriate tool for that. So the simple way is to be put in situations where you no longer have that. And then the other one, and I think this is like a tangible thing you can do, is you need to go find out what is the core problems all these other tools solve, and then which are the limitations of every single one of these tools. I think mm -hmm. too often I see too many demos with too many makers talking about like, oh, it does this, and it does this, and it does this. As solutions architects, we're these kind of losers who sit in the back and they're like, yeah, but what does it not do? Like that's a lot of like that thinking because I would much rather uh, be honest and real with a customer than just keep saying yes and it can do this and it can do this as opposed to getting thanked for that's awesome that you caught that and that you caught that early on we went in this other direction that turned out to be much more profitable as opposed to promising things that I wasn't sure about. Yeah. Did Dude, I answer a question or was right. that kind of roundabout that's, in other ways? No, that was... That was good. That was fire, as uh, Gen Z years would say. You know, um, that was facts, right? Um, no, that's that was good. I don't think there's anything I could possibly add there. Um, but another kind of question that's related to what we're talking here. Um, so besides having bias biases, uh, you know, being uh, removing your bias, what are some other distinguishing characteristics between good architects and good or bad architects or, you know, good consultants and bad consultants. Yeah. Uh, I hear John Russell talk about this a lot. He's done whole lectures on it. He runs the sprint zero podcast. He yeah. has a great explanation on like empathy and the different levels of that. The people I see kind of crush it as solutions architects. Here's something else that I'm going to get yelled at about your years <laughs> of experience do not matter if you're building things that do not bring business value. Can, can you do, can you put like the words thing in front of what I just said on that point? Like <laughs> your years of experience. I will, I'll throw it up. I'll throw it up. Does not yeah. matter, yeah. So yeah, exactly. So your years of experience do not matter if you're building things that do not bring business value. So empathy is where that comes in. It's the reason Copilot hasn't replaced all of us here is because at the end of the day, the person who's consuming Copilot is not AI, at least not yet but it is human beings. And human beings, we need empathy and we need people to understand where we're coming from and what we're trying to do when we don't have the words to express it. And I've seen the people who have incredible empathy can really think through the user's perspective. That's why like, you've had Anna Black on this podcast, and I think Charles Sexton yeah. and Kat, they have this whole accessibility um, user group. And then they talk into like, how do you make less clicks on a page? How do you make it more intuitive? Like, how do you make it more so it's a product somebody wants to use instead of sitting there and thinking like, oh, well, technology-wise, we should do this, this, and this, but being completely disconnected from end users. So yeah. going back to your original question of like, what is kind of like a mistake architects are making or like what strength do they need to be excellent like empathy i've seen people have like one to two years experience in the power platform and offer up solutions way better than somebody who's had like eight years of it i've seen this happen like on the same call when we're all three of us are on it yeah. i can give one too if you want an example sure go ahead yeah some story time okay so here's one and this will be a fun, like, uh, thinker for your audience. Uh, we had a situation, a very large user base underneath our tenant, and we needed to have every single person in there be able to submit a form and then track uh, that form, like, whether that was resolved or not, whether that was, like, uh, let's pretend it's uh, a ticketing system. Now, a lot of people would go with, like, potentially Canvas apps here. Totally works. The only issue you're getting into is when you're having like tens of thousands of users, how can you get them? You're going to go add all of their um, intra groups into your environment. Like that's going to be a nightmare to maintain. If you don't believe me on that, ask Natty Turtledove. He's got amazing security videos on all this. It becomes a giant headache. So what are the other options? People are like, oh, well, we could use the default environment. 
totally all the users are there, but then you get into situations of like, do you really want to be using the default environment? I am no way endorsing that you use that, but that is a situation where that's of concern. So the route that we almost went into that this one architect was proposing was of course a kind of like Canvas app, but then you use reusable forms with like Dataverse on the back, it was fine. And then a lady with less than two years Power Platform experience raised her hand and said, can we use Power Pages? And then we all looked at her like, what are you talking about? Because in our silly heads, we think Power Pages, that's external facing, that's all we can do. She's like, no, 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 no. Like Power Pages is like external facing, but can't we just like limit it to be internal facing? And so only people with our company's uh, email can get into. And then that's just a simple thing we check. Like, do you have this email? And then you're approved to go use the form. And then I'm pretty sure with Power Pages, I could be limited to only the records I've seen. Like, wouldn't that work? Blew the room away. <laughs> like, how convenient of a solution is that? Now, granted, you could get into licensing of Power Pages if you want to go that route. Somebody else offered, you could go via Teams and create like adaptive cards, it's fine. But that is a very elegant, very simple solution if you have the licensing for Power Pages to take this tool and repurpose it just slightly for an incredible end goal. And that's something that like uh, solutions architects who are kind of like very stuck in what they think best practices are, can't think that way. Yeah, I, I do think that there's something to be said about, I mean, I, I've been very fortunate. I, I haven't been on a project where I had an architect who wasn't welcome to, you know, I'm a consultant if anyone is listening and doesn't know. Um, I've never been on a project where an architect wasn't welcome to hearing my input or you know different things. And I do think that that is definitely a huge strength of people that are maybe newer to the platform. Like I, here's a good example. I, I never knew the power platform in, in the old experience. I would, I would learn the power platform in the new power apps and power automate experience. And so and all the features that come with it that maybe aren't possible in the old experience or whatever. And so just as like an example, there there's things that, you know, I've learned over the next the last 2 years that say somebody with 12 years of experience, you know, in the last 3 years they haven't put a ton of effort in learning because they lean on their experience, right? So I, I do think that there's a ton of benefit in what you're saying of having um people on your team and, and, you know, going the extra mile yourself to stay in the know and to, to, to continue to learn and I guess be, be young in, in that yeah. sense. Does that make sense? I guess yeah, no, be young. No, I hear exactly what you're saying, Griffin. You're saying be young where we should only hire the youngest people. Like ageism is good. That, that was your point. So yeah. no, your <laughs> point is like what you're saying is in other terms is the beginner's mind. It's to never lose yeah. that no matter how old you are, no matter how many years of experience. That's how I would sum That's how I understood what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah, because like, for example, um, when I say I, you know, I was super, um, I, you could argue I still am green or super new, but like when I was super, super green before I had really been on a couple projects, I didn't really have any expertise as far as like, okay, what does a typical sales implementation look like i just knew power automate does this power apps does this power pages does this and kind of almost accidentally you know you're you're talking about that that's actually the right way to think about it you know and when you're when you're new and when you're young or new into the space that that's kind of how you think just because that's like that's the default i guess if that makes sense um so i think that's I think that's super interesting. There's there's another thing I, I wanted to ask you that you were you were talking about was having empathy, um, and I'm I guess these things aren't completely one to one, but I would also throw in like having a high EQ. I don't know mm -hmm. how familiar you are with um, emotional intelligence, and I mean, would you be able to speak to just like truly how important that is in just being a good consultant being i mean and i think this applies to even outside of you know software consulting and the power platform obviously but just like i mean we're working with customers that have pain points and we're trying to solve them and they're paying us to solve them and a lot of times it takes a lot of um a high eq to navigate those conversations and to not 
to not make the customer angry or break their heart or, you know, um, tell them they're stupid and, or, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be easy to communicate those things. What, what's your experience on just having a high EQ and why that's so important? Yeah, wonderful question. Griffin, can you walk us through what EQ means? Yeah, actually. Okay, so this is a good trivia question because, I mean, I haven't been studying it, but I've read a couple books. So, um, my understanding, and there's different um, definitions out there, but that your, your EQ is made up of four main components. And that would be, one, your ability to understand your emotions. Like, am I mad? Am I sad? Am I happy? Two is to control your emotions. So like, I'm mad right now. Let me make myself not mad, <laughs> right? right. Um, three is to understand the emotions of the room or like the people I'm with. And then four is to be able to influence the emotions of the people I'm with, the people in the room, right? So in our example, it would be, say I'm on a client call. It would be understanding my emotions, influence my emotions, understanding the client's emotions, and influence the client's emotions. Um, that's how I would define emotional intelligence. Yeah. That was a way better definition than I could do it. I'm very happy I asked you. Uh, <laughs> so the importance of EQ, I think I talked about like the empathy of it and really understanding their point of view for sure. I don't know if this is controversial territory, but there is manipulation to sales. Like, we're, if you look at any good salesperson or you watch any sales training, yeah. they go into manipulating the client. And whether that's good or bad, I would say manipulation in almost all situations is horrible and evil. But as it, to some degrees, is a necessary evil. You can't just give facts because sometimes they don't get it. So in this case, well, I, I think w one quick thing on that, like, I think the manipulation, I, I, I would say, I don't know if I would say that salespeople or, you know, people in general are necessarily manipulating the person they're speaking to, but more of just like their communication of like how they're delivering the message is, I don't know, maybe you disagree, but like there's, there's a, there's a right way to say that someone's wrong and there's a wrong way to say that someone's wrong. Right. But in both ways, they're wrong or in both ways, they you know have this pain point and this product solves it. But like manipulating. I don't know, I guess changing how I communicate that could possibly, I guess, manipulate how they feel. I'm just I'm just rambling. No, but, no, I sorry. like it here. Let, let's let's flip it here. You see an ad that says uh, you need to adopt AI in the workplace or you're going to be left behind. Is that manipulation? I don't know. I mean, you're you're coming at me like you're a I don't know a psychologist here right now. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily call it manipulation. Um, more of just like posing your opinion on me. I guess I don't know. Maybe maybe Who knows? posing my opinion on you <laughs> to get you to do something. Sure, sure. Right. Which yeah. Again, I I think I I've like argued about this with people <laughs> so often, and I don't know. I would love like I. I'm constantly Googling the difference between like manipulation and like persuasion because I'm very yeah. cautious about like, I don't want to be predatory. I don't want to be a bully or mean. And yeah. all I'm seeing in the marketing world is a lot that seems like manipulation to me. So For a sure. phrase like adopt AI, click our link, have us like <laughs> follow our whatever, book our services or you're going to be left behind. Yeah. Like you're going to have this terrible result unless you do what I want you to do. To me, it's I'm trying to control somebody else's behavior, so that is manipulation. I don't know if you're going to keep any of this in the final video, but we'll Yeah, roll. yeah, it'll all be there. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we're rolling. Where I'm getting we're at rolling. with the final EQ is that you will be in situations where, given your role as a tech expert, you're going to, and this is what I see out of almost all the solutions architects I've worked with or really any developer, is we try to be as objective as possible. And we say that there are risks to reusing, uh, there are risks to using app registrations and uh, passwords as opposed to using like certificates that are less reliable. And then the customer might say like, okay, yeah, that's, that's fine and go with it. And it's like, no, 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 they can get the password and then reuse that app registration 
in uh, like malicious ways. Like, okay, that's fine. Your data can be stolen unless you do this idea that like, at what point do you get to that level? And it's one of those things where having high EQ, when you do need to use, and I hate to say manipulative strategies, but what you deem is persuasive strategies to do something that you believe is in the best interest of everyone. You're not just trying to trick them into something. I think that's where EQ does come in. Um, I did my best to give an honest answer that isn't just like, oh, we got to be sympathetic and really understand where people come from. We do got to do that. But then there's this like other side where we have to um, guide people when they're not really seeing or understanding like the consequences of like not really listening to us, which sure. of course, as experts and people of authority, we have to be very careful to not abuse that privilege. And what I try to do is not say things like, you better buy this thing or you're going to be so left behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, we'll take it back to the architect accelerator here. No, I'm just kidding. I'm totally yeah. joking. Um, <laughs> buy my programmer. You will um, never make yeah, yeah. You absolutely will. Um, okay, no, that's good. I, Sean, I could probably talk to you about everything for hours but for the sake of time I, i'd love to to move on to our next topic um you mentioned in, in in earlier that you're passionate about you're passionate about designing and delivering solutions that bring measurable value specifically you like screamed the word measurable right um what does this mean to you if you could elaborate on what that specifically means and like what's an example of a project that's maybe not measurable and one that is and why measurability is important. Okay. Can we do a thought experiment, Griffin? Sure. I'm so sorry. Yeah. This is the weirdest interview you have to do. No, it's okay. all good. This is great. Okay. So you, you've heard of a startup called Google and uh, they, uh, Google, for example, uh, when people use Google search, how is Google making money? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're, su you're suggesting through ads and yeah. or like data or different things. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just pick, uh, there's multiple ways, but let's pick a really obvious one is they make money on ads and suggesting certain pages. Obviously, they try to be as organic and objective as possible, but at the very top, it's people who pay to be there and Google makes money on that. Terrific. All right. So. That is a very measurable part of how Google makes money. Have you heard of uh, Google Keep? No, I, I it, It's a note-taking platform. You, you just take notes. Okay. It comes with your Google account. It's like an over, it's way more simpler than OneNote. OneNote's amazing and way more po uh, powerful. Keep is just like a super bare bones version of that. All right, sure. how does Google Keep make money? It probably doesn't. I couldn't imagine how it does, but. I don't know either. But here's my point <laughs> is, if you're working on the Google Keep team, as opposed to working on the Google search team, and layoffs are coming because everyone is buying a lot of server space to host all their AI and uh, robotics machines, and you're worried about that, would you feel more comfortable if you're on the search team or you're on the Google Keep team? Yeah, being close to revenue is the advice I've gotten from a lot of people. You know, exactly. Being close to revenue and, and you help yourself, yeah. So I guess what, and to offer an even simpler version is, periodically I ask myself, how does my job lead to revenue and can I actually quantify it? Uh, I don't know if, I'm so curious, uh, the fan base you have, and I really hope they're makers. But in this case, it's the concept of, when you can measure how much money you're making your company, just purely by your efforts, whether it's something you built, like automated seven people's jobs, now those seven people are doing other things at the company that are even making more, if you can quantify all that, like you know you're in a really good place. If you can't quantify all that, I would go and start to. And these are key things, not for the paranoia, now it sounds like I'm manipulating because you're gonna lose your job, but no, you can use that data and then go into uh, salary negotiations. Or if you're a freelancer, you can bring in that case study and talk about like, I made X number of money for this company or saved X amount of time. It doesn't always have to be money. And then you're gonna look, you're gonna be seen as like, 
oh, this person measurably did this, of course we have to pay them more. And I do believe that companies, I used to think all they try to do is pay people as little as possible. I do not think that's true anymore. I think companies want to reward you, want to pay you very, very well, but they want to know what exact measurable thing you're bringing them and why your salary is justified. Yeah. So how does that, I understand how that applies to, you know, myself, my job. How does that apply to, okay, I'm developing a power platform solution. How do I measure the value that that's bringing to the customer that is going to be implementing that? Sure. We're actually going to be talking about this on the first day of the three-day challenge you're coming into. That's also available to you for $7 that you get back, so it's free. It can only fall into three categories. There is you're either saving them money, you are making them money, or you are adding a security layer and you're preventing disasters later. Those are really the only three ways you can add any type of like outcome to a business. So whatever app you're working on, you have to think through what exact measurable thing am I saving? Griffin, can I ask you what's a recent, you can make it as simple as, what's a recent feature you built? Or someone you know um, is building. Sure, I guess I could say I'm I'm currently on a project that's looking to implement a uh, a copilot bot for customer service agents to um, search their knowledge base faster so that they can resolve cases faster. Okay, so it's a copilot bot that all right uh, solves cases yeah. faster. How long? Yeah. I don't know if you know this. You can make them a number. How long does it t take to solve a case right now? I think anywhere between 20 minutes to 60 minutes for a, minutes. a care agent to resolve a case. Yeah. Okay. And then how will this bot shrink that time? And then by how much? Yeah. yeah so hopefully right now, um, the care agents have to, they, they utilize customer D365 customer service, but the data that they need is not in dynamics. It's in a, it's in their ERP system. And then all of the knowledge base is in SharePoint. Um, it's not necessarily in customer service. So they have to navigate these different systems and try to find their answers. Okay. And, and so hopefully, sorry, to answer your question. So hopefully the, 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 the co-pilot, the expectation is we can bring all that information to the customer service agent without them having to leave Microsoft Dynamics. Okay. If that makes sense. And that was an awesome explanation. I still yeah. do not know how much faster we estimate this will be by using this format and having that AI chatbot as opposed to what they're doing now, which is taking 60 minutes. Sure. For the sake of throwing out a number, let's say it could reduce it. You know, I mean, it could get them their potential answer in seconds. Um, so it, it could very likely reduce that down to five minutes or to 15 minutes. Wow. So we just went from 60 minutes to one minute. So you increase that threshold by 60, which is quite incredible. And then that is pretty amazing. And with that added 60 minutes, what is that going to give them? It would allow less customer service agents to be able to solve the same amount of cases. Okay. So now we're getting into, and we can like keep going down this rabbit hole, but yeah, where, yeah, it's yeah. Gonna, where the questions are going to get into is like, Okay, so we've saved this much time. That that's pretty cool. Like that's great. People love save time. We still haven't really tied it back to revenue. And then that can go into yeah. like, oh, we have these other case agents who maybe we don't need as many anymore to be doing this specific role. Can they be doing something else? And can those other roles yeah. be bringing in even more revenue? We open up a lot of now, and this is where solutions architects I think can overspend time. Is they're like, oh well, how do we build in Copilot Studio or whatever tool you're going to use? But then here's a great time to look at like, well, SharePoint is going to have its own Copilot. Should you be using that as opposed to Copilot Studio, as opposed to we were talking about Azure AI service. Now we can get into the technicalities here, but like the first thing we need to do is like, what will be our measurable outcome? And so far what we got to is um, things will be processed. We will be saving 60 minutes per transaction per case. And then after how many yeah. cases, how much time are we saving in a day? how many people's jobs can be repurposed to something else. And that's when I think we have like a measurable thing, a measurable outcome we can bring to the company. Yeah. And how much more 
satisfy i guess this isn't as measurable to drive revenue but you you know customers likely would be happier and be more willing to be repeat customers or you know and, and, and different things like that so no i think that's interesting and like so would you say that understanding that and breaking that down would be an important part of like a solutions blueprint or is that more of like on the sales side of like you know pre-sales like i need to be having that conversation or you know i would i now work post sales you know it's the statement of work and different things have been brought to me and now we're responsible for building you know what's in the contract is it still important for me to speak to the those measurable values even though they're already sold on it yeah so they're sold on that specific first of all i don't know if they are sold on that specific line of work but let's pretend they agreed to work with you you have not given them an estimate on how much all of this is going to cost and when you do give that estimate of let's say it's going to cost them two hundred thousand dollars for you all to build this like okay it's two hundred thousand dollars to increase the throughput by 60 minutes per transaction, what justifies them paying $200,000? And then getting into that question of like, should we be building something else that could be actually giving them more growth? Like, is this really the pain point? Like, congratulations, you saved them 60 minutes and now all these workers are just kind of sitting around? Like, is there a game plan for that? So. Yeah. To go back to your actual question of like, do you need to know that as a um, as a technical person? Depends what your role is. If you're a solutions architect, absolutely. It's the person who's jumping between both areas. Sales is a key part of that. If you're more of a technical director and you're just approach this problem and you have to be super niche into what you want to do, goes back to my earlier question of like, are you sure you want to leave Dynamics 365 sales? Uh, no, you absolutely don't. That decision is not made for you. That's not your job. Your job is to go in there and be like, here's what we can and can't do in Dynamics 365 sales. And I know all the nitty gritty of it and how long it'll take. And I could just like quickly answer it. Uh, however, if you want to be in a more architectural role, I don't know a single architect who can't um, answer those types of questions and who doesn't think about those things. And for any sure. freelancer, absolutely. For sure, yeah. No, I think that's great. I I would love to, there's still one other thing I wanted to ask yeah. you. So again, love to, to transition the conversation. I want to be, you know, respectful of everyone's time. Um, you, so I have admittedly zero pro code experience. I've got a, I've got a buddy just, you know, outside of work, whatever, who is computer science major. And I mentioned to him one time that like, I was like, yeah, I, I'm a software consultant. It's like, oh, like, do you know any coding languages? And it's like, honestly, I could maybe read a little HTML and fetch XML. Like, I was like, that's, you know, he laughed at me. Um, Cause he was like, did you, did you just say fetch XML? That is not a coding language. Um, Sounds so, like a great friend. You know, yeah, you know, <laughs> he's, he's a pretty goofy guy. I didn't mean it like that. But nonetheless, you know, you told me that your advice for low code people, low code consultants, architects, would be to learn some pro code. Yeah. I just want to know, you know, pro code can be intimidating. Where would you recommend people start? Why do you recommend this? Um, like why, and you can, you can speak to me. Why would I, why should I take the time to learn a pro code stack, even though I'm, you know, a, a self-acclaimed successful low code consultant? I think you're objectively successful, Griffin. You have a very <laughs> successful YouTube channel, given your age of, and you can bleep what I say right here. Yeah. Um, I don't care. It's all yeah. good. Yeah. So there are certain problems. First of all, low code is pro code. Low code is a nice little wrapper, and underneath it, it's all doing pro code stuff. Almost everything you're doing in Power Automate is spinning up either like Azure functions or like some kind of components in the background or processes that are running. And all of the actions you're using in Power Automate are just making API calls, the same thing you would do in Postman. So it is, it's all pow, it's all pro code underneath the hood. And you will be getting into situations where the problem cannot be, you won't be able to solve the problem just by knowing all of the low code if you don't have those fundamental best practices and an understanding of what's happening behind the hood in pro code. Like for instance, in Canvas apps, if you, why can't you overload a collection? 
So many people are Googling that. Like, how do I add more items to a collection? How do I get past the delegation limit? The delegation limit is there for a reason. If you take all that data and you put it in the browser, it's gonna create something called memory leaks and your browser is gonna explode. Not literally, but it's gonna run incredibly slow and people notice that. And there is a reason for that. When you open up Facebook, you don't see every single message that you've ever received along with every single post that's ever been written. You have to scroll, you have to search, and they have to appear. It's this constant back and forth transaction. So when you have a pro code understanding of what's happening underneath the hood, it's gonna be so much easier to find bugs and so much easier to architect in ways that are a lot more scalable. I suggest that idea of learning some pro code, which by the way, I don't think anyone's gonna take me up on that advice. I would highly suggest people who are these do-it-yourselfers, don't wanna have a mentor, can't have a mentor, don't wanna sign up for any kind of a training program or anything, like if you really wanna grow into that architect role, like you're gonna to have to have either a mentor, a training program, or I would suggest learning some pro code. There are people who've become very, very successful and are very good solutions architects who've made amazing solutions uh, and do not know any pro code and have never learned it, I think in those cases, they're either teaming up with someone who is a pro code developer or they're actually like hiding it and they have spent some time like at least learning what's happening underneath the hood. Yeah. If you were, you know, if you're me or you, you know, you're telling me what, in, in your opinion, what pro code platform, you know, like where, where should I start? If it was like, all right, if I wanted to start learning something and I kind of feel like for me, I don't, I don't necessarily have a ton of experience with canvas apps and with kind of where I work with a lot with Microsoft dynamics. I don't think we really get into needing canvas apps a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So I find myself utilizing, I like have a lot of experience with power automate. And when I first started, Remember, you know, my first couple flows, I thought they were incredible. You know, like, man, look at this flow. It, yeah. you know, it goes and gets a row by ID and then lists some rows out and sends an email. Like, dang, this flow is sick. Right. But I quickly realized that my flows were terrible, right? Mm -hmm. And have made too many mistakes. I don't even want to, you know, talk talk about on people's systems and different things. But I feel like where I would see the most benefit in potentially learning some pro code would be to help support my abilities to create power automate flows. Yeah. Um, understanding that, what would be your advice to me of like, what should I go and learn so that I can be a better power automate developer? If you're just trying to be a better power automate developer, I would say go watch Damien Burt's tutorials. They're incredible and they go into a lot of this stuff. So I would just, if you're just trying to get good at power automate, just keep using power automate. David Wyatt has amazing stuff, like follow them follow my channel, like that'll get you where you need to go. I would say that's not a use case for learning pro code. I would say a use case for learning pro code is like when you want to fundamentally understand what are all these low code tools doing underneath the hood. Now, sure. learning pro code can take forever. However, learning HTML and JavaScript, spinning up like a .NET API that connects to a SQL server and then you, that connects to SQL tables, like being able to query those SQL tables, learning that JavaScript, not as much the .NET part of it, but all those things you're gonna literally be able to apply to your day job in Dynamics like the week after that. Yeah, very cool. Man, Sean, this has been great. I'd love to, yeah. That's good. I, I don't think there's anything I could possibly add. I'd love to transition us to, you know, the after hours, happy hour section of the show, um, approaching the, the end of our discussion here, right? And this is just a section to, you know, pretty lighthearted, talk about anything but work um, or, or work related things and, and getting to know you. I mean, you, you got a ton of energy, a ton of different hobbies and interests and different things. One thing you said, you know, you can uh, still do a kickflip on a state on a skateboard. Yep. And, uh, you had a quarter century life crisis and moved to China to discover your dreams of learning to code. Yeah. And then I don't know how this fits in there, but then you said, and how to do a backflip. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you got me all over the place. Who is, who's Sean and, and, you know, share a little bit more about yourself. Uh, oh, Sean. Uh, yeah. I gave a very scatterbrained idea of who <laughs> I am. Um, I love gymnastics. I love movement. I had the 
um, the honor of being on Mark Smith's podcast, we spent like the first quarter of it talking about dance. His son dances, I love dance, I love movement. Um, you literally have, you're more athletic than me. You literally have a college football <laughs> number at the back. Why don't we talk about that? But me yeah. being here, I think you can understand the enjoyment of moving and you as a uh, collegiate level athlete, I'm sure marvel at figure skating or other athletes that may not necessarily be in your domain. I'm the same way, yeah. and I just I like to try them. I don't I don't want to ever quit learning. So going back to like the beginner's mind we were talking about earlier, I love to try things and keep myself humble. And I love being I love being very bad at things for a long time until I'm not. And I feel like that's brought so much joy to my life and such a rich mixed skill set. And yeah. yeah, just like I never got comfortable just sticking in one kind of technology. I wanted to just keep learning, keep learning. It applies to my personal life. And I love, uh, I love gymnastics. I picked that up when I was 28. I haven't been doing it as much, but I like, I got my first backflip when I was like 30, not even on a trampoline off ground. Griffin's going to link to go. that right now. There you go. <laughs> I got to get you that video now. <laughs> that's <my laughs> um, no, that's good. Yeah, that's good. No, that's awesome. I, I definitely love having an active lifestyle and, and different things and learning how to do things. I mean, I know I have a YouTube channel. I'm by no means YouTube famous, but, you know, taken yeah. over the last year, I've learned a ton about video production, video editing, um, YouTube, um, but also skills that apply, you know, outside of YouTube and um, growing on LinkedIn, expanding my network, interpersonal skills, right, and just different things that, that this – the, the YouTube channel and things have, have brought. So I, I and I, I enjoy having an active lifestyle and, and different things as well. So that's super awesome, man. Sean, if people, I feel like this will be a long list, but if people wanted to connect with you, what would be the best way for them to, to get in contact with you? Yeah, LinkedIn and untethered365.com. That's the, that's the company with all the training and what I put a lot of my soul into to give people the best technical learning experience they've ever had. Yeah, absolutely. Links to all of that down in the description down below, as well as I'll be sure to include a link to the next Architect Accelerator um, course or program um, if you're interested in, in wanting to connect with Sean and, and level up as a part of the program. Man, Sean, thank you, thank you so much for being here. The, the the conversation's been great. I've been really enjoying getting to know you. So I appreciate that, Griffin. It's been great to know you, meet in real life. You're a nice man. <laughs> like isn't that just thank a great you. compliment? Like, and I mean that, that is. Sincerely. That is. Thank you. I I I really appreciate it. Thank you to you for sticking to end the video. My name is Griffin Lickfeld, the host of the Citizen Developer Channel, and I'm excited to connect with you in the next one.